Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the heat pump water heater training brought to you by Electrify Everything Minnesota. My name is Dan Wildenhouse, and I'm the Senior Technical Manager and Residential Advisor for the Electrify Everything program. I am a former contractor. I worked as a contractor for almost 15 years, um, working in a variety of existing homes, new homes, multifamily, and small businesses, really focusing a lot around weatherization, HVAC, and hot water. And in the last 11 or so years, I've put a lot of experience in with inverter heat pumps and heat pump water heaters through both consulting and training. So hopefully I'll bring some good experience to the table for you today and provide you lots of things to think about as you go on this journey. For those of you that are new to the concept of electrification or to the Electrify Everything Minnesota program, let's give you a quick overview on the next few slides. First, this program is supported by the cities of Eden Prairie, Adena, Minneapolis, and St. Louis Park, and is managed by the nonprofit Center for Energy and Environment. This program's goal is to support the gradual electrification of one to four unit homes to promote resident health and climate sustainability. We'll have multiple times where we show you links to the Electrify Everything website, and we hope you'll stay around and check us out. As you progress on the journey to electrification, you'll hear terms such as beneficial electrification, electrification in general, and decarbonization. Real quick level setting here. Decarbonization is really the umbrella term that captures everything we can do both at the building level as well as at the utility level to reduce the carbon equivalency or the greenhouse gas emissions produced by the energy needs in our homes. Electrification is a subset of this and it's more specific to replacing um, combustion equipment like natural gas and propane with efficient electric options. So some examples here might be replacing a gas water heater with a heat pump water heater or replacing a gas stove with an induction stove. So keep this in mind as we go through. Um, this is a component of a larger universe of decarbonization, but today we're gonna to focus on electrification of our water heating. When you hear people talking about electrification, we can maybe understand there are some societal and utility scale and city scale benefits um, to electrifying. But one of the key questions here, particularly for you as a contractor, um, as you're trying to work with a homeowner or for a homeowner who may be listening in today, um, are some, what are the benefits directly for the homeowner? So the main benefits of transitioning to electrically powered equipment are improved health and safety. So by removing combustion equipment out of our homes and to another degree um, out of our communities as necessary, um, we can reduce the ability for us as occupants and residents um, to be in the same place where combustion equipment is. And the gases that come out of combustion equipment can provide severe health and safety risks if not treated well. Second, it's better for our climate in general. Um, so we talked about this. We want to go to cleaner electric sources for many of our end uses in our homes. This will reduce the carbon and the greenhouse gas emissions, hopefully keeping us on a transitional period um, to green by 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, those dates are picked both from federal, international, and then state and local levels. Finally, in some cases, we actually see utility bill savings as well when we electrify. Now, not all scenarios, but we'll show you in a little bit, there are some really good cases where we can get utility bill savings with heat pump water heaters. So within this component, of electrification, utility bill savings is a real possibility. Now, all of this said, electrification can still be a rather confusing topic. There really is a lot going on. The Electrify Everything initiative or program really wants to help residents navigate these choices. So some common questions for a resident that might be interested or asking you about electrification include, where should I start? Um, when should I think about replacing equipment and in what order? What are my upfront costs and my operational costs? Are there resources available to help? Are there incentives and rebates um, and tax credits? And then who do I talk to for guidance and which contractors to talk to to make sure I get quality work? 
the beautiful thing is Electrify Everything Minnesota, our goal is to provide a good starting place for both you, the contractor, and for residents to help answer a lot of these questions. So again, we'll try to cover quite a bit in this training today, but please visit our website to learn more. There are some areas that we have some common recommendations for residents to focus on. And there's really five big places we look at. Um, so we look at them and this is the order of energy impact they tend to have on homes. Um, the first two are, are fairly close. Weatherization, meaning improving the insulation and air sealing and windows and doors of our homes, and the heating and cooling of our homes. Weatherization may not sound like electrification, right? It's kind of a bigger part of the decarbonization effort. But when we weatherize homes, um, we reduce our need for more heating and cooling in particular, and we can improve that indoor air quality. So it really does fit in very nicely with this. You'll see largely bolded here is water heating because that's what we're gonna focus on today. And it is one of the top energy impacts. And we'll go into more detail on this in just a minute. Again, this can be a little challenging to think through. So we're gonna do a quick historical perspective and take a look at what we think the next eight to 10 years is going to look like in terms of where utilities can offer incentives to get the savings they're looking for. So on the left, you'll see we've got the historical rebates and a large portion of them were made up of lighting. But part of what's happened over the last 15 years is our minimum standards, um, the federal standards for lighting and the quality of the equipment that's available has radically changed. So now we see most homes where the majority of lighting are already compact fluorescent bulbs or LED bulbs. So when this happens, it makes it difficult for, let's say a utility to offer incentives to improve lighting. So where do we go? If lighting is really something that we're going to lose some ability on, we're gonna to need to make up new places to look for. So now let's look at the residential sector here. And this is based off of some research and a report that the Center for Energy and Environment did for the state of Minnesota, where we looked and projected where we thought the savings opportunities were really going to be over the next eight to 10 years. And you'll see right there in the middle highlighted in green is water heating as tied for the second largest opportunity. So what we're saying here is as a part, as we look at the general movement of electrification and we identified those top five opportunities, you can see that space heating and cooling and water heating are also large opportunities still for utilities, again, to provide incentives to meet their savings goals. So one of the components to help us along this journey is going to be a general transition of where utilities offer rebates and water heating is going to be one of the big ones moving forward. As a component of this, we get a lot of questions. You know, why buildings it is one of the first that we get. And in truth, most residential emissions in buildings come from natural gas. And this can be both natural gas being used in the homes and in our buildings as well as natural gas necessary, particularly for what we call peaker plants or the short-term rapid response uh, electrical generation. So these greenhouse um, emissions from residential buildings, 64% or almost two thirds come from natural gas and the other 36% come from electricity. Our program can work on the components in the buildings while our utilities simultaneously work to improve and clean our grid and our power sources. So we're really looking to reduce this big chunk of 64% of natural gas in buildings through electrification, while our utilities work on reducing that 36% by cleaning the electricity sources. One of the other questions we get are really two questions that we're gonna address on this slide. One is, well, aren't we going to put the grid at risk if we electrify literally everything? Um, well, if we switched everything today, um, yes, there are some grids that can actually be challenged by this. That said, in the state of Minnesota, most of our electricity generation um, actually has quite a bit of room 
to grow, particularly um, in fall, winter, and spring months. So there's quite a bit of flexibility still in our grid during those times. Water heating is a fairly um, consistent throughout the year um, impact versus say heating obviously is a huge winter impact and cooling is a large summer impact. So there is room to make a lot of electrification, particularly in things like water heating. And if we strategically do it with space heating, um, it's one of the cases there may be a, what's called a dual fuel or a hybrid strategy where we don't do complete electrification, but we take a step in that direction. The second component of this is that we look at what our utilities are doing and how they're trying to decarbonize their electricity generation. And Excel has a carbon free by 2050 plan. You can Google that. And I believe we're also going to have a PDF of this presentation on the website soon. So you'll be able to click on that link yourself. And part of this is going to be to, of course, increase um, the use of renewables, um, there may be some you know, low emissions gas alternatives um, down the road. There are some future opportunities here with what we refer to as renewable natural gas, or even um, potentially using hydrogen through natural gas pipelines. Uh, the challenge is those aren't likely to be cost effective for quite some time. So by the time we make those types of fundamental transitions at a utility scale, um, we could make a large impact at the building level um, during that time, because it is, is or can be cost effective at the building level while the utility is looking for those longer term solutions. One of the first and largest questions I get asked pretty regularly by contractors as we start talking about heat pump water heaters as an opportunity is, well, this is going to be a lot easier to sell if homeowners are going to save energy. Um, that's a very legitimate question, right? Uh, these things do come with a cost. Even if we are able to incentivize most of that incremental cost difference, in other words, the additional cost to go to a heat pump water heater over a gas tank or over a tankless unit or over an electric resistance tank, even if we buy down that cost, it's still helpful to say, will we get year over year savings? Um, this is brought to you by Bradford White. And what they're doing is they're simply referencing the energy guides that are produced. Now, energy guides are very generic and are often national. They use um, climate zone five, which is a slightly warmer climate zone with warmer water temperatures coming in. Um, with this national level, you can look and say, at the top, um, an electric resistance tank may have a $420 approximately annual um, bill, and a heat pump water heater may actually be between $113 and $166. Let's take the 113 if we go size for size. That's a fairly considerable amount of savings there. If you look in the lower left and we look at a gas tank, standard gas tank comparison, um, you could have you know, maybe a $300 bill almost with natural gas annually. And again, as low as a $113 annual bill with a heat pump water heater. So we see some real savings. And we even can see some savings potentially with tankless. Now, this is very helpful, and this is what a lot of consumers may be able to see if they're looking at this energy guide. But part of the questions are, does this hold water in Minnesota? If I'm in Minneapolis, am I actually going to see these savings? Because again, it's colder outside, our ground temperature, therefore our water temperature coming is colder, and we may have different uses and use patterns than, than, the, than the rest of the country. So next, we're gonna take a look at whether or not we can actually translate and save this type of energy in Minnesota. So to answer that question about can we save um, energy and cost, what we call operational cost or utility bills um, by switching to a heat pump water heater in Minneapolis, I took a look here um, at on the left was the DOE's um, estimating cost and efficiency storage for demand and heat pump water heaters. So it's the formulas that are used often um, to be able to generate these projected costs and see whether savings might be there. On the right hand side, you can see a SNP we've taken from a workbook that I created. And what I did here is I took the average natural gas costs in Minnesota, the average electricity costs in Minnesota, 
And then we used some national averages on based off of use patterns and temperature rates required of the water to say about how many therms per day or how much gas does it take per day um, with a gas water heater to do the job. And uh, similarly, what does it take for an electric water heater? When we use these basic components and we follow the recipe that we see on the left, we can actually generate um, these examples. So if you look at what we have highlighted in yellow here, if I had a gas tank system, um, and it was a 0.61 UEF or EF um, rating on it, our annual fuel use and cost with our rates in Minnesota is gonna be around $231. If I had an electric resistance water heater, and we recognize there's not a ton of these in Minneapolis, but it does make up about 10% of our market, we might have a bill as high as $638. If I took either one of those and transitioned them to a heat pump water heater, so let's look at the lower right-hand side where you see the energy factor or the EF of an electrical system of 3.9, that's a good indicator that it's a heat pump water heater. Anything um, pretty much so over one um, with an electric system EF means it's going to be a heat pump created water heater my annual usage estimate is closer to $155. Um, now we could also make a transition to a gas tankless system with a 0.95 energy factor or um, something similar to that. And we get about $150 as our annual estimate. So what does this translate into for savings? So with all that we just described, we can now look at the right hand side here and say, again, if our existing equipment is a 0.61 gas tank and we went with a high efficiency heat pump water heater, we could save about $75 a year in Minnesota with our current gas rates and our current electric rates. Now, you do have to ask the question, over time, do you think the gas rates will stay the same, go down, go up, or be chaotic, meaning sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. So this number is based off of two days rates. If you envision a world where natural gas increases in cost to be used, these numbers would be even better. Now, if I looked at the gas tankless unit, the cost is pretty comparable year over year. So transitioning from a tankless gas unit, we would still get those other benefits we talked about, health and safety, and um, being better for the climate at about the same operational cost. And then comparing it to those electric resistance tanks, again, admitting that's a pretty small percentage, maybe 10% of what we're gonna find out in the market. But there, there are huge savings because we are literally tripling or quadrupling the efficiency of our systems. And so we could see savings up to say $480 a year. So there can be real savings here it does depend on what we started with and what we're going to. Standard electric water heater, heat pump water heater. Both heat water, but they're not quite the same. Notice how you could use either of these things to cut your lawn, but one would do it a lot more efficiently. These can both send your message, but one lets you hear back sooner. See, a heat pump water heater gives you the same reliable hot water as a standard electric water heater, but saves up to 60% of your energy. So even though it does the same task, it's clearly the better tool. Learn more at hotwatersolutionsnw.org. Standard electric. Stand now, that short video um, comes from our friends at Hot Water Solutions Northwest. Um, granted, it is being compared to an electric resistance tank, but why do we say the new standard? Well. Federal minimum standards are developed by the Department of Energy and other federal departments where there's a minimum efficiency that you're allowed to sell in the marketplace. And currently for larger tanks, those over 55 gallons, the minimum efficiency is around a UEF of two or a uniform energy factor of two, which can only be achieved with a heat pump water heater. So for large tanks, this is already the new standard. But for the smaller tanks, for the 50 gallon tanks, something in that range, a smaller residential sized tank, um, it's not yet the standard, but ask yourself, do we foresee if the federal standards have already gone this direction for larger tanks, do we think that is likely to happen for smaller tanks? Most 
folks who say the answer is likely yes. So we want to be prepared. Um, this truly is the new standard when we compare to what else is available in the market for electric water heaters. Now I want to take a quick side journey here um, just for a minute because for you as a business person operating a water heater business or as a plumbing business or a mechanical contractor, um, we like to think that we develop a business case for what we want to sell and how we want to engage with our clients. I'm, I've got two little graphs here. On the left, we have what a lot of contractors are doing right now, and it makes sense for a business-wise, right? We want to look at the lowest first cost option. Now, over time, those costs will go up. The equipment gets more advanced. The federal standards become more advanced. Um, there can be supply chain issues, et cetera. All of that generally means we see costs starting to go up for our lowest first cost option slowly over time. If we compare that on the right with an efficiency or an electrification option, it's a steeper curve, and we admit that. It does cost more in terms of first costs to go with the more efficient or the system that can help to electrify. So the question is, can we fit this in with our business case concept um, and make sure that this is going to be a good business decision for you, the contractor? So let's take a look at this. Um, and we're instead of the, the slight um, curves that you saw, we're going to go more in a step mechanism because we're going to look and think just about the impact of codes and standards, that federal minimum standard I talked about. So every time a federal standard or a code changes, um, right at that moment, there's a large leap forward, usually in efficiency that's needed. And so in a very short moment of time, usually an effective date, we instantly change our minimum efficiency requirements, and so our costs go up. And this is a pain point. And if we're thinking about the every three to eight years, which is um, energy codes are typically on three-year code cycles, whereas federal minimum standards can be anywhere from five to 15-year cycles, so let's just say eight years as an average. Um, you know, if we're waiting to make improvements in what we sell, based off of when we have to make them. We are going to have repeated pain points every time this happens. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, the good news is, um, from this perspective, you're in the same boat as every other contractor. But what we really wanna ask is, can we improve upon this from a business uh, choice perspective? So with any business case, we have to look at things like what are the costs and the risks for making a change? but they have to be balanced and have some transparency to, well, what are the benefits of making those decisions? So here we've got our stair step of, of pain and tragedy, as some contractors may call it, with our code changes over time. And we wanna think about using um, a, a business case perspective to make some choices and see what it does for us. So if we decide when there's a code change or a standards change, instead of just stopping at the minimum efficiency, what if we were to shoot for what we anticipate the next cycle, again, three to eight years down the road, um, what is that efficiency likely to be? Part of this is we're future-proofing our own business, right? We now have one step. Yes, it's a bigger step, but we have one step instead of multiple. And there might be some things we can do in the meantime. So yes, we still have our first pain point, but once we go above that um, federal standard, we're now in the opportunity zone. Now we can be working with residents and homeowners and building owners to sell the benefits of an above code or an above minimum um, standard piece of equipment. So the efficiency and electrification equipment associated with water heating, meaning primarily heat pump water heaters, again, can offer quite a few benefits. If we choose to make that a business choice as a component of our uh, businesses moving forward, we'd rather work in that opportunity zone in that three to eight year cycle, as opposed to just sitting around and waiting for the next pain point to come along. 
Next, we want to myth bust some additional common concerns. So now next, we're going to talk about the technology, the processes, and a lot of the questions that come up with dealing with and thinking about heat pump water heaters. One of the biggest questions we get is the performance. Will these pieces of equipment actually perform like we're promised? Well, that's legitimate to ask. So let's think about what goes into the performance of a water heater. Um, or a heat pump water heater in particular. So part of it is going to be the use pattern. So when do we use hot water? Um, this is really impactful if you have time of use rates, um, which not everyone has right now, but again, think about the future. Is that likely to be where we're going? Um, but also in terms of what kind of technology can meet the back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back morning showers. That's our usage pattern. Next, we want to look at total usage. Are we buying and installing a large enough tank to meet our absolute total usage numbers. Next, the incoming water temperature is quite important. I mentioned earlier when you saw the snip of my workbook, um, we looked at the average therms per day or KWH per day to raise water temperature um, from the incoming water temp through our ground to the delivery temperature. So the lower that incoming water temperature is, the harder it is to meet that performance or more expensive it is. And then specifically for heat pump water heaters, because they have a heat pump on them and heat pumps just move heat. So in this case, they take heat out of the air um, through the refrigeration cycle. It is absorbed into the refrigerant um, and then it will be re-released to heat our water. So the incoming air temperature around our water heater will also matter. We're going to start first by trying to understand um, draw patterns in homes. Now, I've got four different things that you're looking at here. I tried to pick four end uses where I thought at least about half of the um, homes might have them. So we have faucets, um, you know, pretty much so 100% of homes have faucets. Showers, again, pretty close to 100% um, have showers. Over 95% have a clothes washer and about 50%, just a little under 50%, have a bathtub. So let's look at the weekday usage first, because there's five weekdays, and then we'll look at weekend seconds. So the weekday will be the blue lines for each of these. If we look at the faucets, where are our peaks? Those are the times when we have the most draw. And you can see it's about from 6 a.m. to about 9.30 a.m. in the morning, <clears throat> and again, about 5.30 p.m to around 9 p.m. That's where you see the blue peaks. You can look at the red for weekends and you can see it's shifted a little bit in the mornings. Why? People tend to get up a little later if the alarm clock's not going off. Um, but it may be a little bit higher over the course of the day for the faucet because people are actually doing more in their homes, uh, right? Everywhere, thing from washing the car to doing laundry and dishes and, and tasks. Um, we can now look at showers, and you'll see there are two humps, but it's a much more dramatic morning hump. Why is that? Well, in the United States, we're kind of conditioned to shower in the morning before we go to work um, or to help kick off our day. And again, you can see that initial first peak is very similar timing-wise to the faucets. Um, and you can see in blue and in red, it's a little bit later in the day. Um, there is a second peak because there are... A, number of people who like to take showers at the end of the day as well. Um, bathtubs, it's fairly chaotic. It's all over the place, but it is more in the evening than it is in the morning. One of the reasons why, if you want to decompress after a long day and soak in the tub, that's much more common to do in the evening. And then, of course, for people with children. Um, bathing children is its own universe of challenges, and that is more common in evening tasks. Um, and then we can look at clothes washers as well. Um, now, clothes washers, some of the good news is we've seen a lot of improvement in the last 10 years with cold water detergent and a lot of education on cold water washing. So this num these sets of numbers are going down over time, um, and we could see them continuing to go down. So both the technology of the equipment is getting better, um, better homeowner education, and then detergents really designed to work in cold water temperatures um, are really going to lower some of that impact um, from clothes washers. 
This is important to think about because if we understand when these peaks are, we have to say, can our water heater um, recover? Is there enough time to recover between the big usage times? So there's a big usage time in the morning and a big usage time in the evening when you start adding these up. Do we have enough time? Is that enough time for a heat pump water heater to regain the heat um, and reheat all that water? So the next time we have a peak, we're ready for it in our homes. On this particular slide, we're looking at overall water use or what's sometimes referred to as the total draw. Now this is important when we think about water savings on top of energy savings. When we look at the graph on the left, um, you know, you can see there are some houses that use 68 um, gallons per day and there are some houses that use under 10. But the lion's share where we really see it are using between 15 and, and 50 um, gallons per day. It's just an important thing for us to understand is the overall usage in homes aligning with the capabilities of heat pump water heaters. On the right hand side, you can see how this is reflected um, based off of the number of occupants. So when you look at this, there's several things you could see on the graph. There are little bubbles or, or circles. Um, there's a dotted line, looks like a capital I with a dotted line with a hard top and a hard bottom. Um, there's a gray box and then there's a black line within that gray box. I'm not going to overdo it on statistics here, but I want you to mostly be thinking about those gray boxes and the black line within the gray boxes, right? So this is the range where we have a lot of confidence in the data, and then we have a mean or average um, number that's in there. And what you're really seeing is what you would expect. Um, if you have one person in the home, you use less water than if you have two, than if you have three, than if you have four. Ironically, it doesn't change a whole lot from four, five, and six. Um, we tend to use about the same amount of water um, in those homes. Now, part of that is we have fewer homes with six, seven, and 10 people in them. So maybe our data isn't quite as good and robust there, um, but we have a lot of data on you know, two, three, four, and five um, occupant homes. But this is kind of about what you'd expect. So it's important to understand the more people you have up until around five, um, the more hot water you typically need throughout the day. Next up is going to be this incoming water temperature. So again, we're just going through those things that affect performance, the draw pattern, the total draw, and the incoming water temperature. So our national average incoming water temperature, the stuff that was used in the Bradford White um, slide that I showed with the average savings is about 52 degrees Fahrenheit. In Minnesota, the average is, is quite a bit colder. It's about 45. I mean, there are some parts of Minnesota where the average is closer to 39 or 40, and there are some parts of Minnesota where it's closer to 49. So 45 is about our average. And we just want, again, um, want to keep this in mind. We do have, um, colder incoming water temps than does the national average. So let's talk about some proposed solutions or things, ways that we can address these things that impact our performance. So if we look at usage patterns, again, remember we have the spikes in the mornings and in the evenings and total usage, um, which says is more or less, you know, 15 to 50 gallons per day. And it's really based often on how many people are in the house. What are some things we can do? Well, we can limit our water usage when it's time to use it. So, you know, take five minute and fewer showers. Um, again, move our um, bathing down to, uh, uh, move our bathing times down. Um, use cold water for our clothes washing and use low flow aerators on our faucets. We can absolutely do that. And we can also change our scheduling if we needed to. If we had five or six people that live in a home, we could encourage some to take showers in the morning, some to take showers in the evening. Now that's challenging to do, to rely on behavior change. And if you have anybody who looks like this living in the homes, and by that I mean children and teenagers, um, good luck getting them to take five minute showers, um, good luck getting them to do anything you want them to do when you want them to do it. Um, there's a lot of great kids out there, but getting them to universally make a holistic change to when they bathe themselves or bathe at all um, can be its own challenge. So 
yes, we can do some things from a behavior perspective to make those impacts, um, but that's more realistic when we have a household with one or two adults. When we start adding children and teenagers into the mix, this just gets more and more challenging. What about um, proposing solutions to those incoming water temperatures? Well, one thing that's been done for years, and this is not just for um, heat pump water heaters, is doing something called using a thermostatic mixing valve. What this allows us to do is turn the water heater up to 140 or 145 degrees. You're mostly um, familiar with the fact that we typically set between 120 and 125. We do that, we don't wanna go below 120 because things like Legionnaire's disease can grow in our water tanks and it's just not as comfortable to, right, to have cooler water on us. And we don't go above 125 typically because we can have scalding issues. But a thermostatic mixing valve allows us to, again, increase the tank temperature higher and then mix the temperature back down to comfortable usage temperatures between 120 and 125 by mixing it with cold water from the exterior. Now this can be challenging, but this is pretty darn common and it is an approach that can work. Um, it is not for everyone. And you have to think, what does it take to get my tank to 145 degrees, right? Is it um, a heat pump that's doing that work, an electric resistance element or a natural gas burner? All of those things will factor into whether or not using a thermostatic mixing valve makes sense. We could also look at trying to address the usage pattern, total usage and incoming water temperature all at the same time with a fairly simple technique. We can take a look at what the existing tank was um, in terms of size. So if they have a 50 or 40 or 50 gallon tank and ask some simple questions about whether it was electric in the past or gas, um, did this deliver um, the hot water when you needed it? So that third or fourth shower in the morning, was it still hot? Um, and if the question was, if the answer rather was either no, or sometimes it was right on the verge, then we may want to just universally say, we're going to install one size larger tank. So if the existing tank was 40 to 50 degrees, we want to address usage patterns, total usage and incoming water temperatures, um, we could just upsize to a 65 or 66 gallon tank. Similarly, if the existing tank was 60 to 66 and the question was, the answer to the question was either, no, I'm not getting the hot water when I need it all the time, or it's right on the verge, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, we may wanna graduate up to a 75 or 80 gallon tank. So one way we can address all of these is by simply selecting one size larger on our tank. Now, yes, that may impact a little bit that first cost. And of course, there are things like size and weight and dimensions of our tanks that have to be factored in. Um, can it still fit into the old place? But this is an approach that's been quite popular in many parts of the country where heat pump water heater adoption um, is going a lot faster. This is a relatively simple approach that can address those three contributions to performance. Now we can start taking all of this and putting it into a formula um, to say, is the home and are the occupants good candidates for heat pump water heaters? Um, now these are not necessarily um, always yes and no or, or firm answer. Sometimes there's a little variability here, but we generally would like to ask, are they a homeowner? And why is that important? Well, when someone is a renter, we have what's called the split incentive, meaning typically the landlord or the building owner would pay for upgrades like a new water heater, but it's the tenant and the occupant that gets that benefit. So it can be challenging if the person who is making the payment doesn't see that benefit directly. So we do say we think the best opportunity is those that own their own home where that investment and that payoff um, can be aligned. Next we ask, do you have an existing tank water heater? Um, as you saw earlier, there's, you know, it's fairly similar in operational price to go from tankless um, gas to a heat pump water heater. But one of the big differences is tankless water heaters um, have almost an unlimited supply of hot water. And going to any tank, it doesn't matter if it's gas, electric, or heat pump, um, from tankless may be challenging for some homeowners. So 
again, it's not impossible um, to do this, but we think that homeowners where they have an existing tank, again, be it um, an antiquated heat pump water heater, an electric resistance water heater, or most commonly a natural gas water heater, that's another great um, indicator. And then finally, where is the water heater located? Now, this question is a bigger deal in other parts of the country. In Minnesota, and particularly in Minneapolis, by far and away, the majority of our water heaters are installed in basements, either unconditioned, semi-conditioned, or fully conditioned basements. All of those can be good candidates. It's when the water heater is in something like a garage that we start to ask these types of questions, or if the unconditioned basement is actually more like a cellar and it's you know wide open to a crawl space, those are some considerations that may not make this quite as good of a deal. So again, if they're a homeowner with a tank water heater and they're interested in saving money over time, they're potentially currently going through other energy retrofits or electrification projects. They maybe have other heat pump technologies in their home. Um, so they might have a ductless heat pump or an air source heat pump. Um, or they're working with a contractor who recognizes that they're going to utilize that new standard piece of equipment, even for emergency replacements. Those are all good um, differentiators for good potential heat pump water heater customers. And of course, we do wanna make sure we've got a compatible water heater location. Speaking of locations, these are 10 of the most common places where people can put in water heaters. Many of these can work, but we're gonna go through in just a second and look at which of these are ideal or what challenges there may be with some of these locations. So here we can see there are only two in red. Um, attic and what we call a low boy under the sink are those really small um, tank water heaters that we often find in apartment buildings um, where it's underneath the cabinetry in the kitchen. Those are probably not ideal. The attic, not a big issue again in Minnesota, but there are a lot of parts of the country where they put them in attics. It's just putting a very heavy piece of equipment in an attic um, and again, putting water you know, directly over your living space, probably not always the best idea, um, in, particularly in colder climates. Low boy under the sink is challenging because they just are not yet ready to come to market with small heat pump water heaters that can fit in those locations. Other places are all pretty good. Um, anything in green, pretty great. Um, the two in orange, the basement mechanical room, we're not saying basement mechanical rooms are bad, but um, in some older homes, they're kind of shoehorned in under a very steep staircase, for instance, um, from the main body down there. And that's just a physical location, physical difficulty in getting the new heat pump water heater into that space. And there may be a lot of limitations if the mechanical room is located underneath the staircase. Similar if there's a tight closet built around the existing water heater, we see this all the time in manufactured homes, um, but we do see this sometimes in standard residential as well. There's a mechanical closet that is very small that's built around an existing water heater, and those can also be problematic. Otherwise, most of these other locations can work out very well. The next question we get asked all the time is what is sometimes referred to as space heat interaction, or this concept that, wait a minute, doesn't a heat pump water heater produce cool air as part of its operation? And the answer is, it does. So there's been a number of pieces of research that have happened over the years on this. This particular one was from Larson Energy Research um, on behalf of NIA, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. And what they found is they looked at these in a couple of different ways. Um, how about when they're in fully conditioned spaces? So maybe they're in a utility closet in the main floor in a laundry room, something like that. Um, the cooling effect is largely limited just to that room. And it's not a huge effect. We'll look more specifically in a minute on where that's at um, and what it does. What does matter here is the distance from the thermostat. Obviously, you don't wanna blow cold air or cool air directly on a thermostat because that will cause the heating system to go on. But in fully conditioned spaces, that's, this can work. We'll get more specific in a few minutes on what space you need around a water heater when it's inside. The next I wanna look at are these semi-conditioned spaces because this defines a lot of what we see in Minnesota. So the basement, right? Particularly one that is not fully insulated away from the outside. Um, these are actually ideal locations. Um, 
first of all, they're even further away from the thermostat very often. And second, because they're already a couple of degrees cooler than the main body of the home often, we just don't see that space heat interaction having a big issue. So let's get really specific on what the research told us. By the way, this is Ben Larson, the person who did this research. Typically, um, during the heating months, we see a one to two degree temperature impact in the room the water heater is in, the heat pump water heater is in, during those heating months. So again, the heat pump water heater is running, it's producing some cool air. You may see that room drop one to two degrees. And on top of this, these effects are only felt when the unit is running. And it's typically gonna be for about three to five hours a day. So a heat pump water heater will typically, or any water heater will come on uh, to call for heat midway through that peak usage, um, if you remember those graphs earlier. Um, this has a lot to do with you know the uh, uh, size of the water heater, but from the second half of each of those peak times, um, that's when the water heater is trying to reheat um, or heat the new water coming in to maintain tank temperature. And that's typically three to five hours a day is the average. So one to two degrees in the room in specific, three to five hours a day. And we, again, we just don't see much of an impact at all when these are in, installed in basements, other than, again, just don't have the cool air blowing directly where grandma sits because grandma's never happy with cold air blowing on her head. So we just wanna make sure we don't blow the cold air directly on, a, on someone's favorite lazy boy chair or directly on the thermostat. To that question, People say, Dan, can't you duct out a heat pump water heater? Isn't that part of how these work? There's an ability to duct in, duct out, or do neither. Um, so Ben Larson, along with Sarah Witter, um, did some additional research here. And they were looking at um, the difference between systems where we didn't do any ducting, where we just did exhaust, or where we did both, exhaust and supply. They also looked at where the water heater was located, inside the house, in a basement or in a garage. We're gonna ignore the garage ones, those triangles, because um, they just don't represent Minnesota to be very clear, right? But we could say, you know, what's that impact? Um, if there's no ducting, exhaust only, or dual fuel, or uh, dual duct in, duct out, that's going to be red, blue, and green. And then we can look at interior and basements. You can tell from this graph, the things that are really high up, the total site energy change, um, we don't want it to be um, positive and we certainly don't want it to be high up. So if you can see what I've circled there and where the arrow says, don't do this, that is an exhaust only piece of equipment that was located in the house. And so we just vented it out and it had a huge impact on the total energy change in the house. Why is that? Why does ducting out the cool air have a larger impact on the energy use? Well, when we exhaust air out, new air has to come into the home. And if we think about winters in Minneapolis and we're exhausting, let's say, between 175 and 325 cubic feet per minute, or it's about a cubic foot's about a basketball's worth of air, and that's about how much air a heat pump water heater may move is somewhere in that range. If we suck that much out, that much must come in. And if it's negative 10 degrees outside at the worst time of winter, is that what you really want? Would you rather have something that lightly cools a room one to two degrees or something that is bringing in 250 basketballs worth of negative 10 degree air during the middle of the winter at the peak uh, of this runtime? And the answer is no, you most certainly do not. Um, we did find that in general, um, the thing that had the least amount of impact was down in the basement with no exhaust. So the red squares, right? Those are the lowest amount of impact. Guess what? That is most Minnesota installations. So we're going to be in pretty good shape as long as we don't try to duct out just the exhaust. Here, um, we're just summarizing some of the key takeaways from the space heat interaction research that's happened. Um, the PNNL research really found that the distance um, from the thermostat was the dominant factor in determining whether or not the heat pump water heater interacted with the space heater. Um, so it really isn't going to have a big energy penalty at all if you have enough distance and you put them in basements. Uh, the next part of this was, what about the customer interaction component? Do customers complain about cold air? 
Do customers complain about higher bill rates? Um, our friends at Slipstream uh, did heat pump water heaters uh, research in Michigan just last year, and they found um, they put a bunch of installations in basements, as you'd expect. They couldn't detect an increase in space heating at all, and the residents rarely, if ever, complained about um, effects of comfort in their home. And in fact, overall, the survey respondents reported very high satisfaction with this technology. Next, we wanna talk about condensate management. Because a heat pump, much like an air conditioner, will produce condensate when there's moisture in the air. So you have warm or you know, room temperature air that's let's say 50% relative humidity, and you move that air over something that is cool, like the coils um, on the heat pump component of a heat pump water heater, you will get some condensate. So what are the impacts and how do we make sure the maintenance um, that's aligned with this is done correctly? Let's cover quickly again how a heat pump water heater works so we can put into context uh, condensate that is generated. So there is a heat pump on the top of the unit. Like any heat pump or refrigerator, it works by transferring heat as air goes over the coil. And it does this through the compression cycle. So air moves across this coil. Um, the coil will suck heat out of the air. So it's not actually generating any heat. It's just sucking heat out of the air, run it through the coils and around this tank. Now, when this happens with air that say has 50% relative humidity, so there's some moisture in the air, which is most basements and homes in Minnesota, uh, as that warm, moist-ish air goes over these cooler coils where that will strip out the heat as a component of this, it will produce condensate. The good news is, unlike a, say, condensing gas furnace, this condensate is actually safe because it is not acidic in any way, shape, or form. So it's just a matter of the compression cycle and the way that a heat pump operates, transferring this in. So it will generate a little bit of condensate that will need to be addressed. The next logical question becomes, well then, what do we do with this condensate? Um, good news again, it's safe. It's not a ton of condensate, um, but we need to drain it somewhere. So some of the most common locations um, for basements, uh, it's really common to go into a floor drain, into a laundry tub, or into a washing machine vent. For other locations, perhaps um, the heat pump water heater is being installed on the main floor of the home, and perhaps a utility closet, we actually want to drain that condensate outside. There's going to be a couple of approaches here, but a basic component is the tank itself must be very level. Now this, we always want water heaters to be level. They're heavy, they're tall. It just makes sense to do this. It's extra important when we're gonna be dealing with condensate because we're gonna have two approaches to dealing with this. The first is gravity. And the, again, gravity, good news, gravity will never let you down as long as you're on planet Earth. It's just physics. The second possibility would be to use a condensate pump, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you still need gravity to get that condensate to the pump. So let's talk about this next. So how much condensate are we really talking about? Well, it does depend on really two key components. It's gonna depend on how long the heat pump needs to run. You may recall earlier, we mentioned that it runs about three to five and a half hours a day. Again, that's gonna depend a lot on how many people are using the water, um, how hot they like their water, how many consecutive showers, baths, or draws are done in a pattern. So if there are three or four showers in a row, or you do the dishes and the laundry and the dishwasher and take a shower all in a row, that will produce longer runtime. So that's one thing that will produce uh, reason that condensate will be produced. But truly, the amount of moisture in the air will dictate a lot of that. In our Minnesota homes, this typically means when they're put in the basement. So the average production is somewhere around two quarts per day. This is a kind of a national average, having looked at homes in a lot of places across the country. And for something like this, an existing air conditioner or condensate pump, this can handle that level of load. So we wanna look for something that's about two gallons per minute. Um, again, we just wanna make sure if there's a reservoir on our pump or the pump is sitting in a pan, 
um, that you know we don't have any overflow or any challenges like that. So a basic AC condensate pump that one rated about two gallons per minute should do the work. Um, you might want to consider um, thinking about the higher end of this in terms of both size and rate when you're in basements, because of course we have to, if we're not going to a floor drain um, or to a laundry tub, we have to go higher up, right? We're gonna have to move that condensate to a higher place to either tap into a drain line or to get that moisture outside. So just be thinking about this. Um, if we have to go up in elevation with our condensate, so we, in order to remove it from the home, um, we're going to need a little bit more available, what they refer to as lift with our pump. Now I mentioned this earlier, it's just worth repeating. The condensate um, that comes off of a heat pump water heater or any heat pump or refrigerator or any of these pieces, um, these are uh, non-acidic um, because it is not a byproduct of combustion. So when we burn gases, be it propane or oil or natural gas, um, the moisture that is produced from there, um, it comes in this hot, warm air. And then as it starts to go up, um, it cools and condensate comes out, but it's containing a bunch of the little particulates um, and potentially some VOCs from that combustion process. So that is a more, much more acidic um, process and we would actually then need to use neutralizers uh, to treat that condensate. That is not the case with heat pump water heaters or any heat pump or refrigerator. Um, so it really is nice because you can effectively put that condensate again directly down a drain or into a flower bed or somewhere like that without causing any harm. Next up, when we talk about putting together our condensate line. <clears throat> it's tempting to just use a bunch of elbows. This allows us to quickly route where we want to go, but there's a couple of potential issues with this. The main issue is we want to be able to get easy clean out. So what is called a T connector, if you look at the upper left hand side of your screen, that's your T connector. Um, again, these are often required by local codes in many locations, particularly when these are inside of our buildings. Um, but whether that is code in your local jurisdiction or not, it is absolutely the recommended practice. Um, it can do a few other things. Um, it can actually work a little bit as pressure relief, but the primary job here is to provide you that easy clean out of the condensate line. Uh, the last thing we want is for this to get plugged over time. So are there any places we shouldn't run our condensate drainage, right? I've listed many of the places we can run it. Of course, anything like a sidewalk or walking service around the home where this moisture could come out and freeze during our colder months. Uh, we definitely have cold months in Minnesota. So if it condensate is coming out and it is say getting onto a walkway, um, a sidewalk, uh, even on a back porch or patio, that's a really potential hazard for slipping and falling. So we would certainly not wanna do that. Also putting the moisture right up against the foundation of the home. Again, we're not talking about a tremendous amount of moisture, but it can cause a little bit of ground erosion there. And we may already be dealing with things like bulk water um, from our neighborhood and from our yard and making sure we've got the proper grading. Adding more moisture, um, particularly in a very specific small area, may cause pitting of the earth, some additional erosion, and that could over time lead to a source for water to enter into our basement. And then finally, we do not wanna to try to put these directly into sewer lines. There's a number of reasons why. There's no reason to take what is considered um, clean water or light gray water and mix it into dark gray or black water. Um, that's kind of a waste of the potential for the water, but also sometimes our sewer lines, particularly near the house, can be slightly pressurized. Uh, we most certainly would never want sewage to back up into our sump pump or into a pan. So please avoid our sewer lines at all costs. Treat this as clean water, um, but it is water and it should be dealt with like any condensate producing fixture in our home. 
The last thing we want to bring up when it comes to our condensate and the management of it. Um, the good news is most of the equipment that we see nowadays has these long warranties, uh, which is great for customers. And most of them have a condensate alarm installed. Now, these can operate a couple of different ways. It can either be um, a sound and a light that comes on on the panel of the control panel for your heat pump water heater, and or it may also trigger um, a warning or indicator on your smartphone if you've downloaded the app. Now, the example that we have here um, is from a very specific brand and it has the fault code of F20 will be displayed and an alarm will sound and we can just touch anything on the keypad and it will silence the alarm, but that F20 fault code will need to be addressed. And that's an indication that we've got a clog in our condensate. So with a little bit of experience and a little education for homeowners, we can help them understand that yes, there is condensate. Yes, it does need to be addressed, but there's protection built in. So this does not become something um, that easily or readily is going to cause damage to our homes because again, we can track it um, and have an alarm let us know should there be a need um, to do a little bit more cleaning for a clogged condensate drain. There are a couple of other things we do wanna to touch on when we do these trainings. Um, some of these are, are, are the questions that we continue to get along with the condensate and the cost. Um, and that is, what about the filters? Um, do I need to change filters? This is something that is not common, right, for most consumers when dealing with a water heater. Um, we may be familiar with it in the context of our heat pump or our air conditioner or our gas furnace for our home, maybe even some other ventilation and filtration equipment, but we don't typically associate that with a water heater. Now, because we are moving air over a coil, and we're hoping to, again, extract or remove moisture and temperature out of that airstream, we need to make sure our coils don't get dirty too quickly. And the easiest way to do that is to have a simple filter like the ones that you see before you here. Now, these typically can just be pulled out and rinsed off and or vacuumed or used um, compressed air on them to clean them relatively quickly. If you follow your manufacturer's instructions, it will give you two critical pieces of information. The regular schedule that the filter should be cleaned, it can vary a little bit manufacturer by manufacturer, and the preferred mechanism or method for cleaning it. Typically, there's an alarm as well for this, uh, for, for the filter cleaning. Now, this is not going to be a pressure sensor that is um, usually indicating that uh, we see some increased resistance due to a dirty filter. These are usually just simply based on time. And so it's most often something like every three, four, or six months, you'll get a reminder alarm or, or an alert as more accurate that just tells you, hey, don't forget, it's time to clean that filter. So for a consumer, these are parts of the contractor experience of educating them about the condensate, about the costs, about the air that will be moving across these coils. So the consumer is well prepared for their experience. Some contractors choose to offer a maintenance contract similar to what they might have done for an HVAC system. And this might include regular checks of the condensate line, uh, double checking filters, checking for fault codes on the device and the equipment, double checking that the equipment is in the mode that the homeowners predicted or asked for it to be, sometimes things like power failures um, in a building or an adventurous teenager or guest, um, you know, can make adjustments and change the mode. So all of that can fall under a maintenance contract um, that you may choose to offer. Again, this will also likely be new. Most consumers are not used to a maintenance contract for a water heater, so be wary and, you know, don't make this a high ticket item, but it is something you could add to the process particularly if you're also doing HVAC for the homeowner and you can combine this as part of a regular maintenance check-in. One of the last things we wanna talk about in the context of demystifying heat pump water heaters and addressing some of the regular questions we get is, doesn't this piece of equipment make noise? 
Well, yes, it does have a compressor on it, so it will make some noise. But this is not a very large amount of noise. If you imagine a modern um, Energy Star dishwasher, we're talking about something in that realm. If you look at the typical sounds um, of decibels that we're seeing here, this is kind of like an urban residence, a um, little less than a conversation where someone is standing three feet away from you. It's certainly nowhere near as loud as I am, for instance. Um, so this gives you a, a bit of an ability to think this through. You probably wouldn't want the water heater right next to the bed or right next to the area where you read or sometimes even too close to the TV room. If you do, something as simple as a wall or barrier blocking that area off from the areas of concern can address the noise considerations here. So yes, they do produce some noise. It is not a very loud amount. We recommend you look and talk with manufacturers because each of them have a slightly different range in this approximately. I think it's actually some of them are down as low as 44 decibels now, 44 to 52 decibels. This is not a tremendous difference, um, but you know it, it can, uh, you know, going from 44 to 52 is not quite doubling, but it is a considerable um, louder. So definitely check the manufacturers. Um, if this is something that you feel will be a major concern for your consumers, you may want to select a brand that produces the lowest amount of noise. As we start to wrap up, the discussions about some of the challenges that get brought up and some of the questions that we repeatedly hear both from contractors and homeowners. Um, we've mentioned that there is often an app that can be downloaded and used by consumers and by contractors for heat pump water heaters. What you're seeing on the screen here is Reams app, but all the major manufacturers have some version of this and there's always a list of benefits. Now, Maybe not every single piece of equipment will have the exact same alerts or notifications that it provides, but this is a pretty common list. So leak detection notification could be one. At the bottom of these water heaters, one of the options you can get, and it's pretty common, is a leak detection wire. So it's a small wire, comes off the bottom of the water heater. You set the water heater in a pan. If it detects water in there, it will send a notification. Hey, I think there's a leak in your water heater. Um, a contractor such as yourself can enter your contact information in here. Um, and this would allow the homeowner, if there were a notification, whether it's the filter alarm, um, the shutoff valve control, the condensate management alert, um, or a leak detection, they could potentially alert you or call you straight out of the app if your contact information is entered. Um, homeowners can actually control their unit. So, oh geez, the in-laws are coming. Um, I forgot to set the water heater to a per higher performance mode. You could control that remotely or the opposite. We're going on vacation to Disney World. I forgot we want to set and turn off um, any of the performance modes and leave it in hybrid only while we're on vacation. That kind of controllability can be done from the app. Again, you'll see here filter alarms, time of use programming. So. If and when you are working in a utility area that has a time of use rate, you can actually direct the water heater to only come on during lower um, use times. Now, of course, that's predicated upon the fact, will it still deliver the, enough hot water for you? And that's something you have to have that discussion with the homeowner. But all of this stuff is available in general, and you wanna work with each manufacturer to find out specifically what does their app capable of communicating to a consumer? As we move to a more modern world and we're seeing younger home buyers, <clears throat> I think this is going to become um, a fairly critical benefit that we're going to want to recognize and associate with uh, a piece of equipment that is a little bit more technologically advanced than the average water heater. So you would almost expect it to have some smart controls. So really be thinking about this, learn the different products that are available to you to sell and install and find the ones that make sense for you and your staff and for your average home buyer and average home owner. When you do that, you can truly turn these benefits into part of the value that you offer. 
when we do full sales courses, um, we actually go through a, a, an entire section where we do some role playing. Obviously, since this is a recorded webinar, we're not going to do that today, but I wanted to give you an, a bit of an indication of how we typically encourage people to respond to some of these very common questions. Some of them may even be questions that you've had, and hopefully we've addressed some of these today, but let's just go through them a little quickly and make sure we all feel we're on the same page. So one of the first ones we get pretty regularly is, it's too expensive. Yes, this equipment is more expensive than a standard electric tank water heater. So we could talk about the fact that there are up to 60% savings, again, depending on what the original piece of equipment was. Um, so for um, an electric resistance tank, 60% savings. For a gas tank, maybe something in the 30% savings range. And there are these incentives. And we'll, we've talked about this a little bit today. We'll talk a little bit more about this specifically. And we've got new incentives coming to the market, in the forms of tax credits and statewide rebates. Another question we get all the time is, you know, this stuff feels relatively new. I'm not really sure this is reliable. Well, on top of the fact that we've had heat pumps in our homes for decades, I mean, think about, you know, the very first time we had refrigerators in homes. Um, that's the same basic technology. You can add to that that most of these pieces of equipment have at least a 10-year warranty, and some of the brands are beginning to offer 12-year warranties. So we have major manufacturers, the ones who represent over 90% of residential water heaters, making heat pump water heaters and offering warranties longer than the standard gas or standard electric resistance tank. Again, uh, a twist on this is the technology, it just seems too new to me. Uh, I, I like new things, but I don't know if I wanna be on the quote unquote bleeding edge of this technology. <clears throat> well, again, as I just mentioned, heat pump technology has been around for over 60 years in our homes. This really isn't that new and water heaters have been around for decades. We're just marrying two technologies together. Perhaps the most common, I don't want to run out of hot water. So these have more or less the same delivery as a standard tank. And I'm gonna walk you through, again, some of the specifications in terms of delivery rating and first hour rating, and some of the more common ways that we evaluate and describe water heaters in just a minute. But you can tell at the very least We've, we're trying to buy down the cost through long-term savings of operational costs, as well as incentives on the front end. We've got great warranties. We're talking about technology that's been in our homes for six decades. And these tanks have the same delivery as a standard tank. And if you really are concerned, you could always go up a size, um, assuming you have the space in your home. And that would give you even more capacity or capability um, to ensure you don't run out of hot water. So what about those incentives and rebates um, that I just mentioned, okay? We talked a little bit ago about the operational cost savings, right? Um, that was comparing a gas tank to a heat pump water heater, an electric tank to a heat pump water heater, both of which produce pretty darn good savings. Um, and then we looked at a gas tankless, which depending on where you're at and depending on the efficiency of that tankless, is approximately uh, the same operational cost. Now we can begin to look at some of the incentives and rebates that are in front of us. So both Excel Energy and Dakota Electric do offer incentives to upgrade from an electric resistance tank. So if you already have an electric resistance tank, you can upgrade and it's a pretty good incentive, right? Four to $500 here. Now I know that people may say, but Dan, we don't see a ton of electric resistant tanks. Well, it is almost 10% of the market um, in the greater Minneapolis area. So it's not the premier place, but it is representing about 10%. Beyond that, both St. Louis Park and Adena have reimbursement rebates. So they will reimburse you $800 after proof of installation. And again, this can be applied to a gas conversion so that's a pretty nice additional benefit. On top of this, we do have the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in 2022. And one of the things that is has changed is the 25C tax credit. 
this has been around in one form or another for quite some time. And it has had some starts and stops. The 25C has been passed now and it's with a 10 year life. And it's been changed to allow up to 30% of the project cost or up to $2,000. So a tax credit, assuming you have a tax liability, is available to you to take for qualifying equipment. Now we have these other two, um, the Homes Rebate Program and the home, High Efficiency Electrification Rebate uh, Programs. These are yet to come online as of the recording of this webinar. So keep these in mind. These are a little bit to be determined. Uh, we're currently going through a process where the states are getting finalized guidelines, hopefully by July 1st of 2023 by the Department of Energy, and then states will apply and submit their own plans. The HOMES program judges HOMES based off of what percentage of savings they get over their current status. So it's either 20%, 30, 35%. The higher your savings go, the more your rebates can be. Anyone could, in theory, get these homes rebates. You would have to do a few steps. There's some energy modeling involved, and you have to have someone come and look at the home. Um, it, so, it, But it is not inherently income qualified. However, if someone does meet the income qualifications, they can get up to double of the project costs covered. So it's very important to understand the homes rebates will exist for everyone that's willing to go through the process. For those who are, again, income qualified, there are larger dollar numbers attached. Then the high efficiency electrification program. All of this is for income qualified, and it's all specifically for electrifying our equipment. Um, so this is for going from gas to electric specifically. Um, for an income qualified person, they could get up to $1,750 for a heat pump water heater. So you can begin to look at this and say, wow, some of this is stackable, right? The, you may not be able to stack the homes and the HERA at the same time, but you could take one of those two along with the 25C tax credit. And if you were in St. Louis Park in Adena, um, get that a reimbursement back. We're all of a sudden talking about a series of credits, incentives, and rebates that may be the same or more than the additional purchase and installation cost for a heat pump water heater. It does depend where you're at. It will depend when all these programs come live, but know that right now those city reimbursements are available. The utility incentives, if you're upgrading from electric to electric, are available and the Inflation Reduction Act's 25C tax credit is currently available and should be for, again, the next 10 years. So highly recommend that you, the contractors, get to know these different incentives, um, these different rebates, and these different tax credits, because it's a really terrific way for you to help a homeowner see not just the value, but make that cost decision make sense for them. So far, we've just touched a little bit on the sizing. Uh, we mentioned, you know, due to draw patterns and the types of people in the homes, we may want to go up a size in a water heater. We also talked about, um, you know, if this is a primary concern, if this is the number one concern for a homeowner, they may want to go up a size. But I want to jump in and, and do a little bit more detail oriented. And you can kind of think of these as some basic cheat sheets. Each of the manufacturers has something similar to this in their own collateral and materials. So I'm taking a bunch of the averages of them. Uh, if you're deciding to work with a specific brand or manufacturer, you're gonna want to get to know their specifics um, and, and use those when you communicate with homeowners. But what I'm about to show you is very good general guidance uh, all around for installation, sizing, and selection of heat pump water heaters. So let's start with our general recommendations for success. <clears throat> now, I refer to this top left as a rough sizing guesstimator because let's face it, no two people are exactly the same. Um, so when we say a 50 gallon tank is likely appropriate for two to three people, well, of course, it depends on who these people are, their age, how often they bathe, 
how long they shower for, all of that stuff will matter a fair amount. But in general, a 50 gallon tank is fairly appropriate, at least for a home of two. So you've got a, a couple of retirees um, who are looking at their forever house where they're going to retire. Um, a 50 gallon heat pump water heater may work just terrific for them. When you're talking about two to four people, um, you may wanna go to this 65 or 66 gallon tank. And if you're having even more, say three to six people, you would definitely want to default to an 80 gallon tank. Again, just a rough sizing guesstimate, um, but something that we find is fairly common across the brands. Some other reasons why you might consider going up a size from the tank size that is existing in the house today. Well, the first is if you are going from a gas storage unit to a heat pump water heater. And this will become clear in a few minutes when I show you the lower, um, uh, the lower table. Um, in this case, if you're going from gas to a heat pump water heater and you have more than two people in the home, it's probably worth considering going up a size. If your house includes children and or teenagers, as we mentioned before, it's probably worth going up a size. And then finally, because this equipment has you know 10 year warranties, if you think the occupancy of your building is likely to change um, in less than half that amount of time, so five years or sooner, you may want to go up a size, particularly if that change is um, someone new coming into the family. So perhaps uh, the homeowners are having a baby. Um, perhaps someone is getting married or maybe, uh, you know, the child that went off to school is coming back home uh, to live back home. If we're likely to see occupancy changes like that, the next five years, these are all really good times to think about going up a size and just protecting the homeowner from a future challenge. Now we can look more specifically down below. Um, so these estimations, again, these are averages based off of all of the popular and common equipment that's out there. And these are five of the big um, indicators that are often used by water heater sales folks. Um, probably most of you watching this, you've referenced um, some of these numbers yourself when you've been selling water heaters. So the first is how many consecutive showers in a row can these deliver? Um, it varies a little bit, but heat pump water heaters typically somewhere between around three, between 2.75 and 3.25. Gas tanks may be able to go a little bit more, more like three and a half. An electric resistance tank is within that same range as the heat pump water heater. <clears throat> when we think about the efficiency, um, now again, efficiency matters and can translate directly to cost if you're using the same fuel type. Um, if you're switching fuel types, you'll want to refer to that cost calculator. But if this would also work for thinking about things like carbon or just the general concept of wanting to reduce and cut waste out of your life. The higher the UEF, the better, um, and heat pump water heaters really have UEFs at 2.9 or higher, whereas gas tanks are in the 0.61 to 0.70 typically, and electric resistant tanks are 0.92 to 0.95. The next one is the first hour rating, or the number of gallons of hot water delivered in the first hour. And what you'll notice here is it's virtually the same, um, regardless of these tank sizes. Why? This is um, really based off the size of the tank not how the water is heated. So a heat pump water heater, a gas tank, or an electric resistant tank will typically all have the same first hour rating if it's a 50 gallon or 65 or 80 gallon tank. This last or the second to last one is where we really still see one remaining difference um, between gas equipment and even our most efficient electric equipment. And this is um, the recovery rate or the gallons of heater um, can raise by 90 degrees in one hour. And again, because we have colder incoming water temps in uh, Minnesota than we do across the rest of the country, this does matter. And because the gas tanks burning natural gas burn at a higher temperature, they do have a faster recovery rate. So earlier when I said going from a gas storage unit to a heat pump water heater is a good reason to potentially size up, this is one of the things we're talking about. Because the recovery rate is a little slower, um, 
from a heat pump water heater to a gas tank. This is the kind of thing that protecting ourselves by making sure we have enough capacity or ready to uh, use gallons, um, that's going to be what really protects us here. Why does the heat pump water heater have a better recovery rate than electric resistance tank? Uh, well, that's because they have both the heat pump compressor and electric resistance elements. And they're able, again, to be um, work in concert uh, and to prioritize one over the other, depending on whether or not there's an actionable call for heat at the moment. So it really does provide a lot of neat flexibility and a heat pump water heater can actually have a recovery rate better than its electric resistance cousin, but not quite as good as a gas tank. So that's that one place that we really say, if you're switching from gas to heat pump water heater, particularly if you have more than two people in the home, it's really worth considering going up a tank size or properly setting the expectation for the homeowner. Finally, as I mentioned before, um, the average warranty, 10 to 12 years for heat pump water heaters. We see our gas tanks and our electric resistant tanks are typically in the six to 10 year range. So you actually are getting manufacturers putting their money where their mouth is around heat pump water heaters and putting the parts and tank warranty together. One of the things that's really interesting for some of these brands, uh, the warranty actually covers not just a component, but the entire tank or the entire compressor at the same time. This just makes it easier for them to source and install them versus doing it component by component. Um, that could change over time, but it is interesting. Get to know the brands and this will help you be able to communicate this to homeowners. I wanna cover just a few more components here um, that really can help when we want to be successful with sizing and installing heat pump water heaters. So a couple of things to note. Um, location, location, location. The location does matter. When we put these um, inside of our homes, we need to have volume in the room that they're going in, somewhere between 450 and say 800 cubic feet. It differs brand by brand. So that could mean that the space, the closet or the room that it's in is that size, or that if there's a door that um, disconnects that room from the main body of the house, that it's a louvered door um, that allows for that air to communicate. So that is an important thing. What happens if it's put into too small of a space is there is the potential that you could rapidly cool the air around the immediate tank um, and cooler air going over the coil would mean it's going to be a little less efficient. If it runs for five hours that way, it could lose a lot of its efficiency. So not typically a problem, but just to be considered, this is most likely going to be when you have a mechanical closet um, or a small closet in general in a basement um, and you, the water heater makes sense to put it in there. Um, you may just wanna go with a louvered door or communication vents to the main body. A couple of other notes, um, because there is a compressor on the top of these, uh, they're about on average 18 inches taller for the same size tank. So a 50 gallon heat pump water heater will typically be about 18 inches taller than a 50 gallon standard gas or electric tank. They also can weigh somewhere between 60 and 80 pounds more. Um, so we, we say it 75 as kind of an average. Um, so that's a fair amount of additional weight and that weight is on the top, so it's top heavy. So just getting familiar with how to move these around, navigate around the post and under the stairs and through the small closet door are all things um, that just take experience to do because they're bigger um, and heavier than their cousins. Finally, this is true of any water heater. Um, if in terms of location, if you're putting it in a basement or in a place with a concrete slab floor, you should really, the recommended practice is to put a foam pad between the water heater and the cement floor. Um, heat pump water heaters already have great insulation around them, and that really helps make sure that the heat that is being put into the water heater isn't lost to the greater room around it. But think about ground contact. That is something that ground is, you know, something near 50 to 52 degrees year round. Um, that is a 
pretty big delta from the tank as opposed to say the 65 to 70 degree air around it. So really making sure we're well disconnected. It's about the only part of a water heater where we'd ever say maybe a little bit of extra help in terms of insulation is warranted. So put a foam pad underneath any water heater you put in a basement. Definitely do it for a heat pump water heater where we're trying to maximize efficiency. When it comes to modes, there are, are several. So some brands have five modes, some have four, some have six. Um, and they, they range everywhere from, on one end, it's a pure performance range. And that is going to be uh, either alternating between the compressor and electric resistance elements, or just going full blast electric resistance elements, or both of them working simultaneously. Those are sometimes referred as to as performance modes. Um, what we really recommend is the hybrid or auto mode. This is how they are shipped. This is what it will come out of the gate as. And this is the best combination of efficiency and performance. So in these cases, the heat pump will do most of the heating and will get small boosts from the electric resistance elements only when needed. Um, now, if you have a home with only two people living in it or you're, um, it is not an a year round residence. So perhaps the people take off the winter and they go to Florida or Arizona, something of that nature, or just they're on vacation regularly. The heat pump or efficiency mode is a really great idea for those times. Um, so again, it might be all the time for a home that only has a couple people living in it, or it might be seasonal or just while you're on vacation the heat pump or efficiency mode will ensure that the water um, doesn't get um, cold in there. The heat pump water heater isn't going to be put in a position where it has to overcome a really you know, large delta in temperature, which helps us prevent things like Legionnaire's disease and some of the other challenges that come with not keeping the water hot enough. But because we're either on vacation or we've got low usage patterns, we just don't simply have that same draw that we mentioned before. So there's less of a need for the water heater to have to really dig in and provide high heat in short amounts of time. So the heat pumper efficiency mode should work just great again for homes with two people or fewer, less than average water use, people that vacation a lot, or people that um, have a seasonal home where they spend perhaps months at a time at a secondary location. All worth considering. Again, this is all going to be available to you. And all of this is also, again, in the manufacturer's um, individual collateral and brochures. So get to know the brands, get to know the specific brand or two that you feel your company is most likely to offer, and you can fine tune these recommendations based on the specifics. Here, I just wanna show you a very quick video, um, quick in the terms that it's um, less than six minutes long. So I'm just gonna play it and let it run. Um, this goes through a lot of the overall installation guidance from pros themselves, from contractors um, that have worked with the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance and the Hot Water Solutions Program, and have really dialed in the expertise on heat pump water heaters. So hopefully you'll find some value in this. And let's just play this and we'll let it run through for a few. Hello, I'm Bruce Magclark, heat pump water heater enthusiast and expert with the Hot Water Solutions Program. And I'm Wade Cohn, licensed journeyman plumber partnering with the Hot Water Solutions Program. And today Wade is going to take us through a step-by-step -step process of installing a heat pump water heater. Before we get started, are there any major differences between installing a heat pump water heater and a standard electric tank? Most things you do to install a heat pump water heater are very similar to the standard electric. There are some minor considerations for the new technology, but they're nothing to worry about. We'll cover them in this video. These tanks come in different sizes. How does an installer go about getting the best fit for the family? Well, like always, we have to consider the local plumbing code and meet minimum requirements. And then we ask the family if they're having any issues with the current tank size. And if so, then we'll upsize it for them. Here we have a tank that we've decided to replace. It's old, it's leaking, it keeps rusting, and of course we have pulled the necessary permits. In a previous discussion, Wade, you mentioned that there are some differences between installing a standard electric water tank and a heat pump water heater. What are they? 
Well, it's serviceability. We're going to have a heat pump on here that's going to need service from time to time. The one we're installing is going to require six inches off of the wall, but that does vary, so make sure you check your installation manual. The next thing that you have to consider is airflow. In this case, we're in a garage, so it's not going to require a duct kit, but if we were in a smaller space, we might need to do that. The other thing is we're going to draw some moisture out of the air in the form of condensate. We need to dispose of that properly as well. I see some tanks going with expansion tanks. When does code require an expansion tank? Whenever the system is closed, and we have an open system here, but if you had a backflow preventer on your house or something like that, of course we have to have some expansion. Okay, Wade, what do we got to do to get this tank out of here? Well, we need to turn off the circuit breaker for the water heater. Now I'm going to use a voltage detector to make sure that the circuit breaker was marked properly, and in this case it was. Now I'm going to get it drained. I'm going to hook up a hose to it, leave the water on to flush any debris out of it, and then I'll shut the water off and introduce air. If it drains real slow, we'll use a transfer pump. Now that we've got the water heater completely drained, I'm going to remove the flex supply lines and the electrical power. Now that we've got the old unit removed, there are some things that we need to do before we get the new unit in place. The old unit had the water inlet and the hot water outlet on the top. On the new unit, those are on the side. So I have to move the plumbing for that. We also have to have the six inch distance off the wall. So I'm going to prep for that as well. Wade, you've been very busy. You want to tell us what you've done? Sure. Like I talked about earlier, we had to move the waters from the top inlet and outlet to a side inlet and outlet, so I moved the water piping down there. I also used construction channel to space it six inches off the wall. We've got a styrofoam pad on the bottom to prevent the concrete from absorbing the heat from the water heater. Of course, if we were on a wood frame structure or something like that, we'd use a drain pan. We've also got seismic strapping on here. It's required here in the Pacific Northwest. Our next step is to run the condensate drain. I've heard the condensate might be acidic and you have to take special precautions before disposing of it. Well, that's only true when you're running a fossil fuel for a heat source. But since we're just drawing the heat out of the air, it's no different than the condensate on a cold glass of water on a hot summer day. Now that we finished up with the condensate drain, the next step is to make our final connection with the water lines, the inlet and the outlet. Well, you've made all the water connections. What's the next step? Well, I'm going to turn on the cold water valve to fill this tank. Then can we hook up the electricity? Well, before we do that, we need to go inside and turn on some hot water fixtures <coughs> and make sure we purge all the air out of the system and get it filled full of water. Otherwise, if we turn on the electrical connection before that, we could damage the water. <coughs> Because I've filled the tank with water and have purged all the air out of it, now I can go ahead and make that electrical connection. Now that we have the electrical connection complete, the last step before we turn on the power is to hook up the temperature and pressure relief drain. Okay, Bruce, we've got the unit installed and I just turned the power on. Is there anything else we need to know? There are a few other considerations we should talk about. First one is heat pump water heaters, the default mode is called the hybrid mode. It's a highly efficient mode. For instructions on the other modes, please refer to your owner's manual. And the big difference between heat pump water heaters and all other kinds of water heaters is they move air. And because they move air, they have a filter. And that filter should be checked and cleaned approximately every three months. We really appreciate you watching. For more information, go to Hot Water Solutions nw.org forward slash partners. Okay, there were a couple of things here that I hope you picked up on. The first is that many of the steps in installing a heat pump water heater would be similar to the steps of installing any water heater, particularly an electric water heater. So that's one thing to understand is a lot of this <clears throat> should be very familiar. Second, um, some of the specifics that were called out here, um, where the water connections were on the water heater, and that getting six inches off of the wall, those are specific to a unique brand. Um, some brands have um, the water connections at the top, some have the water connections at the front and side, and others have both options. So of the three manufacturers, 
learn which ones have those different connections, what makes the most sense for you and what you're most likely to see. Similarly, the amount of distance you might need in terms of clearance from a wall is going to be different brand by brand and whether or not you are likely to need to do some sort of ducting. So all of this is just to point out, um, there are considerations here. Hopefully most of this is resonating with you and making sense. Um, but what we just saw was specific to an electric tank, to an electric heat pump water heater conversion with a specific brand. Your experiences may vary. We have two sections left. Both have value, but I want to get this clear to begin with. Next, we're going to talk about different ways that heat pump water heaters are rated or the tiers that they're associated with. This really has to do with how efficient is the piece of equipment that I'm buying and that I'm selling to a homeowner. After we go through this section, we'll talk a little bit more about next steps for you as a contractor and ensuring that you're working with Electrify Everything and you're getting properly listed. So first, let's take a look at what we refer to as a product tier overview. Now, why do we need to bother with this? Can't we just say it's either Energy Star or it's not? And on some level, you absolutely can. But it's helpful to understand some of these other things like the tiers that you see here, right? Not the kinds of tiers that uh, we cry over um, when the dog runs away, but the types of tiers in terms of tier five being the highest tier currently, where tier one was the original heat pump water heaters that kind of came into the market in 2009. This is great because this is one way you can help differentiate different products in the conversation with homeowners. On the left, you are going to see there are some links that you can connect on to learn more about the advanced water heater specification and the user's guide for qualified products. So a lot of what we see right now in the market are going to be tier three and tier four water heaters. So all of these are capable of it being installed in unconditioned installations, not really a challenge in Minnesota, but in other parts of the country, you know, a garage might be a good in instance. Um, in a lot of parts of the country, um, that's a common place for water heaters but they also need to be able to be installed in semi-conditioned spaces. And that's going to be a place where we see a lot of installations, right? Um, basements that are semi or partially conditioned, but not fully. They're not fully insulated from the exterior or air sealed, um, but they're partially. So making sure that the equipment meets these as well as being Energy Star com compliant, um, being qualified to install in conditioned installations, so inside of the home, this effectively means it's ductible, right? There's a ductwork strategy, um, but it, it has a few other um, components as well. It has to have the ability to manage condensate. Again, it's a heat pump, so there will be some. It has to be capable of having intake and exhaust ducting. And then it needs to have air filter management, meaning be able to give you a notification and reminder to change and clean the air filters. And it has to have a sound rating Tier three had a sound rating maximum of 55. Tier four and higher has a sound rating decibel uh, maximum of 50. Um, both need to be demand response capable. What really sets the tier four apart from the tier three is again that sound rating, but also the way that the algorithms are um, designed in the computer that is in the heat pump water heater. They wanna make sure that there's limited use of the resistance elements. What does that really mean? It means they prioritize the compressor first whenever possible to do that heating of the water. So it's just a helpful way to be able to, if you're looking at a couple of pieces of equipment for a homeowner, you might look at one piece that's tier three, another piece that's tier four. They are both likely Energy Star compliant. Well, they would be on this ratings spectrum. So they both may qualify for the variety of incentives we talked about but you could use this as a way to differentiate and have that discussion with homeowners about why a tier four unit, um, what additional value does it bring to them beyond being just a little bit more efficient. There's another component of this thing called the advanced water heater specification, and that is creation of something called the cool climate efficiency. 
Now, do we really need another efficiency, right? We already have the UEF or the uniform energy factor. What real value do we have in cool climate efficiency? Well, this was created in order to better represent performance when we see heat pump water heaters installed in semi or unconditioned spaces in cooler climates. So cooler climates typically mean climate zone five, six, seven, and eight in the United States, or climate zone four where there's higher elevations. So for these, we basically say, you may want to look at the cool climate efficiency um, as opposed to the UEF when you're making installations in semi-conditioned or unconditioned basements. So in those scenarios, this is just a better way to reference how this is likely to perform in that slightly cooler climate. For 99% of what you, our contractors, are doing, this won't make that big of a difference. But if you were to, for instance, be using energy modeling software to show compliance, potentially, let's say, for the Homes Rebate Program, or potentially this is a new construction, um, or someone just is doing an energy audit and wants to kind of look at what are the overall efficiency impacts in the home, we would recommend if the equipment is being installed in a semi-conditioned or unconditioned basement, that you would enter the CCE instead of the UEF into the energy modeling software to more accurately represent performance. Again, this is not something you have to know, but it's really helpful to understand. There's an entire um, movement of people out there. Um, the Advanced Water Heating Initiative, the Hot Water Solutions Team, NIA, NEEP, many different organizations across the United States are very interested and have committed a lot of time and effort to making sure we actually get the results that we hope to get when we install a heat pump water heater. And understanding and learning more about the advanced water heater specification gives you another tool in your belt to be able to have discussions with homeowners, with utility staff, with local government, any and all stakeholders um, who want to play a role here. And it's a way for you to set yourself apart from your competition is to understand these specifications and understand the tiers and the cool climate efficiency. At your base level, as long as you're installing uh, Energy Star rated equipment and you're installing it correctly, you're going to be fine for most of the rebates and incentives out there. Just consider this to be that, again, that additional layer that could be helpful to you, not required. If you're interested in learning more about the advanced water heater specification, um, there's a link right here that will show it to you that you can click on. Um, it will take you to it. Um, again, this was most recently updated in March of 2022. So it is fairly up to date. And again, it's really designed to address these cooler climates, uh, climate zones five, six, and seven, or climate zone four with real elevation. So again, not required, but something potentially worth it to you. Um, you can absolutely take a look at this, uh, learn more about it, and help set yourself apart from your competition. This is our last slide on the heat, um, advanced water heater specification. Uh, if you remember earlier, we had the tiers um, where you saw the colored stacks of blocks. This is just a different way um, to show you the, the heat pump water heater product tier overview. Um, now we're just kind of doing it in your standard list. So if you look at the left-hand side, um, you see tier three has a cool climate efficiency of 2.6 or higher, plus it meets everything in tier two, plus it has this ability to do simultaneous intake and exhaust ducting, air filter management, and override and default mode behavior um, as per certain components of the specification. Tier four does everything that tier three does, plus um, it has a cool climate efficiency of 3.0 or higher, and physical design or default controls that limit that resistance element heating to less than the upper 50% of the tank. So again, these are strategies and designs to really make sure the heat pump does the lion's share of the work. Some other things about the advanced water heater specification that why this might resonate with you. Um, if you remember earlier, I showed you 
the incoming water temperature in Minnesota on average as compared to the nation. Um, and it was closer to 50 degrees, if you recall, um, than the national average was. Well, some of the things the advanced water heater specification does is it does the DOE testing for uniform energy factor and it adds some additional components. It does the cool climate efficiency with a lower air temperature around the unit as well as a lower water inlet temperature. So more accurate to a cooler climate. It also has some compressor cutoff temperatures built in um, and it has some sound pressure measurement tests. Again, these are all components of the tiers um, that you see. So these are tested in the, with the advanced water heater specification. Each of the major manufacturers offers cool climate efficiency ratings and the advanced water heater specification tiers. So when you're engaging, you can ask uh, whether it's A.O. Smith or Bradford White or Ream or some of their cousins like State um, you can ask for what NIA tier is this or what advanced water heater specification tier is this and what is the cool climate efficiency. All the major manufacturers recognize the value of this and are doing the testing to align with it. Again, I apologize if this is more than you needed to know, um, but we do find it to be valuable in our cooler climates for truly understanding this. And the more you can learn about this specification, the better you are uh, at being able to sell and understand today's equipment and be future-proofed should um, state codes or federal standards begin to change and require cool climate efficiency and advanced water heater specification tiers. And now we come to the home stretch. We're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the heat pump water heater installer network. Again, Electrify Everything is hoping to create an installer network with the goal to be to accelerate the adoption of heat pump water heaters in the greater Minneapolis area. So the heat pump water heater installer network is going to be listed on the website and referred to during all resident engagements. Um, so this is a real opportunity if you choose to join for your name to be associated with this network and for your name to rise to the top when engaged homeowners are asking questions about electrification and water heating. Now that you've actually attended this webinar, or perhaps you've attended a live version of this training, there's only a few pieces of paperwork left for you to do to have your company listed. So here's our criteria. Attend this training. Step one, congratulations, you're there. You'll need to complete um, the participation agreement You'll have to send proof of license bonding and send proof of insurance as you might expect. So you can contact the program at info at electrifyeverythingmn.org um, to get the rest of this paperwork, complete it and get yourself listed. Again, our goal is to help elevate you both through this training in terms of your knowledge um, and your comfort with heat pump water heaters but then through the website to elevate you in front of engaged consumers who are already asking these questions about how do I do these next steps and who do I talk to? We wanna make sure that you are right there in front and ready to do this work. A few other quick notes here. Um, when you join this network, uh, this membership will give you a full year before you need to do a pretty simple renewal process. Our criteria for renewed membership after a first year is you, and that means both the employee who attended this training primarily, are still employed with the company. So if you've moved to a different company, um, we're going to need to assess uh, where this renewal goes. Does it go with you or, or stay with the company? So the company would effectively have to have someone on staff who has completed this training in order for them to be awarded. If it is you who has moved, then the company that you've moved to must meet all the criteria and in either case, the company has to have installed at least one heat pump water heater within that last calendar year. Again, this is not really challenging criteria. It's designed just to ensure that you're staying engaged so when we um, present you as an option 
to an interested and engaged homeowner. Uh, we wanna make sure that your engagement level, your recognition and your comfort um, with the heat pump water heater technology is a real benefit um, to the homeowners who've already come to us asking these questions. Um, at the end of that year, the program is gonna contact you and your company uh, to start this process every year. With all of this, we'd be remiss if we didn't remind you to check out electrifyeverythingmn.org. Um, check fairly regularly. Uh, we have upfront and operational cost ranges for equipment. We're continually adding details of technology options. Uh, we're continually adding additional notes on installation concerns and considerations. And we have links to very many resources and additional information. So check out electrifyeverythingmn.org, bookmark it, and revisit it often, even if you choose not to become uh, part of our installer network today, understanding what's happening with the Electrify Everything Minnesota will put you in the right position. So when you are ready, this is a quote unquote, no brainer decision for you and your company. Um, and you'll be well armed with all the information you need to know that this is going to be beneficial for you and for the customers who are reaching out and are very engaged about electrification. Speaking of lots and lots of resources, um, this is an awful lot to locate on the front of the website. So it's here in this training. Again, the three major manufacturers, A.O. Smith, Bradford White, and Ream, make up over 90% of the residential water heaters in our marketplace. And you can go to these websites and learn just a ton more. One of the things I love is each of these groups has their own training website. Um, they also have places where you can find sales representatives, find distributors, look up user manuals and specification sheets. All of this is at your fingertips. We've even included their support phone numbers here to make it really easy for you, the contractor, as you're trying to vet and look at which of these manufacturers and product types make the most sense for you. We hope you'll spend some time going through these resource links, um, using this contact information, and really finding um, a brand or model or both that you're really happy with representing and putting into these homes. This would not have been possible without some of the assistance that Hot Water Solutions NW um, gave us, Hot Water Solutions Northwest, as well as the Advanced Water Heating Initiative. Both of the links are here. We've also had great contact and communication with the representatives from Ream, A.O. Smith and Bradford White. Again, without them making a training like this available to you simply would not be possible. So hopefully this is resonating with you. Um, and we wanna thank all of these people and these stakeholders who have helped make this possible. With that, I wanna thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Um, we know that uh, watching and listening to a recorded webinar isn't always everybody's first idea of a great time, but hopefully this was a little bit entertaining and more importantly, hopefully you learned something and you're motivated to join our installer network. Please don't forget to check us out at info at electrifyeverythingmn.org and at the website in general. And again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's meant a lot to us. Thank you and we hope to see you on the front lines, installing heat pump water heaters soon.